As always, it's great to have you listening to The Public Square today. I'm Wayne Shepard here with a team. Dave Zanotti, Alan St. Duncan's our producer. Rob Walgate's here, Melanie Elsie, Jeff Sanders. So all present and accounted for, Dave. Oh, Wayne, this is one of those broadcasts where I've been waiting all week to get back to the microphones, and I knew we (laughs) couldn't do it without help. Uh, So what we're going to do today is continue our conversation from last week because we've had some wonderful listener response for which we are very, very grateful. Um, And I I told you I had some fear and trepidation going into last week's broadcast Mm -hmm. because- I remember you saying that, yeah. uh, Yeah, I I just, I, I, you know, I I don't exactly know always how exactly to say these things, but I think people wonder, what is it that we're trying to accomplish here? We have all these different kinds of radio programs that we've been building since 1989. We have a two-minute broadcast. We have a 30-minute daily broadcast. We have an hour-long weekly broadcast. We have 1850 Main Street, which is a three times a week, usually a podcast environment with our dear friend, Michael Del Giorno. We appear regularly um, uh, on his program, Your Morning Show, uh, now that's in, I believe, six cities across the country and soon to be 15. Uh, Rob Walgate's on the air all the time. We're on on. Um, different stations, uh, secular, commercial, non-religious uh, uh, stations, uh, non-profit stations. Where, uh, what are you trying to do here? Well, one thing I can tell you is we're not trying to build a crowd. Hmm. All right. That's number one. We're not trying to build a crowd. Number two, we're not trying to create a database for marketing purposes because we gather nothing from people by doing this, and if they, uh, the only way someone gets into our database is if they choose to. That's it. And if someone chooses to and says, "Well, put me on your monthly update," we send them a monthly update. They're kind of surprised because they thought it would be a monthly fundraising letter, but real, it, what it is is, it's yeah. actually a monthly update on what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and 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 what are we trying to do? We're trying to have a conversation. We're trying to have a conversation in the hope that we can all rediscover what America is and how we can rightly relate to this experience of being American in this time and space in the context of biblical revelation, in the context of what Dr. Glover would often call true truth, and Dr. Schaefer as well. And so in some ways, these, all of these different radio outreaches, they're just the classrooms of a university that's continually going on. But it's a, it's a, it's a fellowship as well. It's not just we know something you don't know, because guess what? We don't. <laughs> and if we do, it's only because somebody helped us find it. So it goes back to that old uh, parable about one beggar trying to help another beggar on where to find a piece of bread. So we stumbled last week into this conversation of escapism driven by listeners talking to people across the country. We're hearing this continuing theme of, of hopelessness, of, of, of just basically giving up because America seems so far gone that it's like, I, I just, I'm overwhelmed by it. And we tried to build a platform that, that basically says, okay, now, now is running away or giving up a, a biblical point of view? Is that a faith-filled point of view? Is that a right versus wrong question? Is that require moral courage? Is it, is it dare I say, cowardice? What, what is this? And, and, and so we've had all kinds of reflections and all kinds of people have written. And I got to tell you, one of the favorite uh, letters that came in to me was from a gentleman who has um, been a longtime member of Alcoholics Anonymous and been sober for many, many years and he talked in his letter about his life and how he had basically, the, the, the point of everything changing for him was when he truly surrendered his hopeless, helpless circumstances to the person of Jesus Christ. And then he realized that basically the whole world is hopeless and helpless. He was just able to process that because it was so personal for him with the addiction. So that when he looks at these broader questions, he basically says the answer was the same for me in my crisis as it is for our country. We need Jesus. And we need to surrender to the knowledge that we can't fix ourselves. We need help. And that letter deeply touched me. And I thought, wow, 
this guy, wow, really, it's a powerful, powerful card. We had several other, other letters that came in. Um, and so what I wanted to do was I wanted to come back to the topic, but I didn't want to come back without getting help. Okay. And so, <laughs> <laughs> therefore, therefore, I put in the call, the 911 call to yep. our trustee and to uh, an anchor author of the American Mission Center Library, Dr. William B. Allen. And I asked Dr. Allen if he would sit in with us today. And what I did, and I hope everyone else will be comfortable with this because I'm just telling you now, I asked him to listen to the broadcast and give us show notes on what we needed to know better than we knew or how we could improve. So in the vulnerability of the public square, non-scripted reality radio, welcome, dear friend, Dr. Allen. Talk to us, friend. We need your help. Good, good morning to you all. So good to join you again. And I want to thank you for that lovely broadcast last week. I listened to it most intently. And I thought that you did a marvelous job of giving some illustration about the nature of the difficulties we face. Doc, is it okay to use the word escapism? Now, I should, I should also let people know for brand new listeners, Dr. William B. Allen is one of the most eminent political philosophers currently alive in our wonderful country today. His credentials, you can read all about them. We won't take your time or the listeners' times to fill all those pieces in. But this is the gold standard. And so I'm going to ask you, Doc, did I mess up using a word that maybe some philosopher somewhere had co-opted for another meaning? Or is escapism an okay way to talk about this? Well, I, I don't know about the philosophers, but I can tell you that the one thing that occurred to me as I listened to the program was a missing word, which is related to the word escapism, but is very different. And that's the word defeatism. Mm. Mm. And it occurred to me that what you're really talking about is a defeatist attitude, a giving up on God. And, and it, it was that dimension of it that really forcefully struck my attention. Uh, because it, if you remember, the scriptures are very clear. Uh, you can look at Isaiah 5, for example, to see God talking about the vineyard in which mm -hmm. he sought good grapes but brought forth wild grapes. And we know what he did with it. He withdrew the protective hedges and fences around it, shed no rain upon it, and allowed it to be trampled. So that people have anxiety about God's trampling is not crazy. Uh, we could say the same thing if we go to John 15, the first 15 or so verses, where he says uh, he, his father is the husbandman of the vineyard. And he goes through a discussion about how a vineyard should be tended. So, so that those who, whom you describe as escapists, it seems to me, are looking at this nation as a vineyard. And they know Scripture tells us God sometimes withers fig trees. God sometimes blasts vineyards. And, and that shouldn't be a surprise to us. So, so I wouldn't call them escapists, but I would call them defeatists because they're giving up on God. And the thing that occurred to me as I listened to you was the hymn. Victory in Jesus. Oh, yeah. He sought me and oh, bought awesome. me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. And what did he do? He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Uh, now, it, it seems to me that's a non defeatist attitude. And the, what you call escapism is therefore defeatism more than escapism. And I apologize for that telephone. <laughs> oh, it makes it more vibrant. We're getting listener response already. Yeah, listeners are calling in. <laughs> it's, it's, it's perfect. Oh, no. <laughs> vic, vic, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Yes. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love, love is to is him. Due him. Do him. Oh, do well, him. We remember singing that, huh? Yeah. That was my favorite hymn growing up. It was page 82 in our hymnal at Boys Church. I remember that. That was probably because you were thinking about wearing uh, the the, uh, the basketball uniform while you were singing it, yeah. right? I also knew the service maybe was coming to a close when yeah. we were singing yeah. <laughs> When we got to page 82. Teenage Rob. Teenage Rob. Rob refers to that ancient book called a hymnal. We now sing off the wall <laughs> choruses. So. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> Bring back to him. <laughs> so, Doc, um, uh, thank you. And and I, I've already, I, for listeners, you should know, I'm watching everyone taking notes at the same time. Isaiah chapter 5, Jesus quoted Isaiah chapter 5 and got himself in trouble. Yes, indeed. Because he brought that 
passage back out to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the, of the law and basically said, I got a story for you. <laughs> and they knew he was talking about them. And, and that story, of course, is a continuation of something he said often, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Uh, people sometimes forget Jesus pronounced curses as well as blessings. And, and so those who are anxious about God's curses have good reason to be so. That's called realism. But realism doesn't have to yield to defeatism. Because we understand that, as you described so very well in last week's discussion, when God sent the 12 out, or the 500, whatever the case may be, he told them it isn't going to be easy. You are going to find the vineyard fall into ruin in many places. And you're going to be reviled even by your fathers, your mothers, your brothers, and your sisters, and you're going to be persecuted and executed. Mm. And, and of course, we see that up into our own day. Uh, our Latin study this season is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And what we're doing with Bonhoeffer is going back to that uh, marvelous, uh, how can I describe this? The, the, we, we're going to meditate on how to deal with Christ when Christ says, put away your sword in Gethsemane and take up your cross throughout. Put away your sword and take up your cross. Sometimes misapplied as God counseling pacifism, but people forget that before he went to Gethsemane, he told the 12 to take up swords. So, so he only meant put away your sword for now. <laughs> no, he didn't mean you won't sometimes need your sword. And there's no reason to be defeatist or pacifistic. But it is important always to recall that there is a job to be done. The Great Commission is yet to be done. And it's never going to be easy. We are just getting started with our very special guest here today on The Public Square. Stay with us. There is much more to come. Across the land. Now back to the public square. We exercised our call a friend option today on the public square and have Dr. <laughs> William B. Allen with us. Well, Dave, you said that we need to call in some help. So that's, you know, phone a friend, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Indeed. Thanks, Wayne. And our friend is Dr. William B. Allen, who is a trustee of our organization for which we are very, very grateful for his service, uh, which he volunteers out of the benevolence and love of his heart. I know when I asked Dr. Allen uh, to consider our board's unanimous request that he be a part of us, he said, I'm in the deboarding segment of my life. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that's good. That's he, very good. Because he serves and has served over the years so many organizations, so many associations, including um, our, our, our government um, as the chairman of the Civil Rights Commission. Um, and uh, so many other uh, wonderful opportunities through his life. And I've gotten to know many of them, and I'm, I'm, they're, they're a bit staggering in, in, in their efforts. So I can understand his desire to deboard, but he said yes to us. Good. And then when we asked him, would, would we would be please be one of the anchor authors of the American Mission Center because we've been so touched by his writing over the many years. And let me just give you a quick run on that. We can start with his work on George Washington, which mm -hmm. is in and of itself, uh, an apex of not just scholarship, but of understanding and of outreach, so that his classic work uh, on the uh, accumulating over 700 pages of Washington's writings from condensing over 100,000 documents uh, of, of, of reading through and, analyze, and analyzing those, that document is 
for sale even this very hour at Mount Vernon at the home of George Washington. It's the go-to book. And I remind listeners that your conversation with Dr. Allen about his book is in the archive as well, recorded at Mount Vernon. Yes, yes. And you can find it right here at thepublicsquare.com. Uh, his work on Harriet Beecher Stowe and on Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, remarkable. Um, and and he has a new work, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, that it's it's not going to be a question of eclipsing the others because the others are extraordinary. His work on the Federalist Papers, his work on the life of James Madison. Um, it, it, enough that we said to him, we need a whole section of our library just so people will be able to come and study your scholarship. This must be preserved and manifested. Well, then he goes... And does what, well, what we're going to tell you about in about 10 minutes, so stick close. He releases a new book. Uh, but before <laughs> we get there, before we get there, let's go back to escapism for just a moment more. Um, escapism, defeatism. I know listeners have asked me, Doc, and I would ask you the same question. Do you think God's given up on America? I don't think God gives up on man. But I want to tell you something. We need to be reminded always that nations are not necessarily forever. Spartan lasted 800 years. That was a long time. Mm -hmm. The Roman constitution survived 400 years. That was a long time. We're now well into 250 years. We're getting long in the tooth. Mm -hmm. Nations don't necessarily survive forever. But God does. Amen. I want to people to remember that Rome fell after Constantine began the change that introduced Christianity, not as a, a, a rump dissident group, but at the heart of Roman life. And yet, of course, when Rome fell, Christianity did not fall. That's critically important to understand. The empire disintegrated while Christianity spread and grew. Therefore, there is no Christian in the United States who needs to despair that the fate of the United States equals the fate of Christianity. We can still do our work. We can still carry out the Great Commission, no matter what comes of this nation. And I don't mean to be pessimistic about the nation. I'm just saying we need to be realistic that nations do not necessarily survive. Is it possible, Doc, that um, because we have so brokered our access to the franchise, to voting, that we continue to expand and expand and expand to not just everyone voting, but everyone voting on everything, um, and, and that we've, we've moved to a point where um, it's, I, I don't want to use the term mob rule in a negative fashion, but it's, it seems more like politics is, is more like either a high school student council race or a televised edition of American Idol. Uh, it, it, somehow we have, we, we have trivialized all this process. At the same time, we've lost a lot of our understandings of what good government looks like. And my point yes. is, is it possible that we could end up sort of voting ourselves out of existence and not even being aware of what we're doing to ourselves? Well, well there's something in what you're saying. And I, I remember 54 years ago, it's been a long time now, I guess, uh, when I was teaching students in France who were, of course, very eager to talk about democracy and the right to vote and who were, in a sense, boasting of their accomplishments. And I had to remind them, you don't vote. To vote, you've got to be in America where you have a vote that comes around every other month. You're constantly voting. <laughs> so there is that sense in which we overvote, you might say, and that can produce some bad habits. But, but remember what that voting means, because as we know, as Christ himself said, all authority has been placed in his hands. And that means every authority, every power, every potentate, every prince, every legislature is subject to the command of Christ. Now, in the United States, authority is in the hands of the people. Dwell on that. All that voting is carrying out the command of Christ under his authority. And if we're not paying due attention to it, if we're trivializing it, we're not neglecting our civic obligations. 
we're neglecting our obligation to God, to Christ. Is it possible that in the American founding, we got closer to the heart of God in regards to true uh, political authority residing in the will of the people? What I will say is this, we got to the form that allows us to get closer to God than humankind has ever gotten. The form of life, the form of government that allows us to get closer than human beings have ever gotten before. Whether we, we in our hearts are closer, that varies from generation to generation. But the form makes it possible for us to be closer than 80 have ever been. Most people don't know that in addition to the many credentials that you have earned over uh, your lifetime of scholarship and service, you're also an ordained minister. That's and uh, I've had the privilege of listening to you uh, speak in church. I've had the privilege of going to church with you. And um, I wonder how the question of escapism, as we talked about it, uh, fits into how you see effective ministry in congregational life in these days. Oh, I can give you a wonderful example of that because I've been criticizing churches for this. Uh, you will find many churches that record their services, but don't want other people to record them, that lock them up in the sanctuary. And I say, what kind of execution of the Great Commission is this to lock the word up in the sanctuary? <laughs> <laughs> can, can you imagine the letter to Ephesians being written with a annotation at the bottom, do not distribute? <laughs> 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 Copyright. <laughs> so, so, so we can look at the practices of our fellow churchmen and see that they sometimes run afoul of the commission because they think, whether for reasons of monetizing it or fear of the secular world, they need to lock what they're doing inside their sanctuaries. And that's totally inconsistent with the job that God has assigned to us. One of the things that I have been persuaded by in the recent years is Jesus describing himself as the light. Yes. Now, everyone's aware of John chapter 1, in which Jesus is described by the writer John as the light yes. of the world. But mm -hmm. I think sometimes we miss that Jesus defined himself as the light as well. Yes. And one of the things I've struggled with, uh, not coming from an evangelical tradition, was was when the Lord came looking for me and graciously found me, I did feel that sense of enlightenment, that sense of now things make sense because Jesus is real and mm -hmm. not just someone who hung on a cross. It, 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 he's real. He's alive. And what I've struggled with in recent years is how many churches have decided to form congregations that basically go into a cave for 90 minutes on Sunday morning and turn all the lights off yes. and, 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 then, and then turn on smoke machines and sing songs. And I thought to myself, I don't get it. I, I'm, I'm oversimplifying and no one, I, I don't mean to be unfair, but it does, I don't get it. Yes. I, I quite get, look, celebration is fine. Let, let's not be too condemnatory of celebration. And Christians have something to celebrate so that when they come together in fellowship, uh, I'm willing to receive that sense of celebration, but not at the expense of testifying, witnessing. And celebration is not witness. Witness goes outside the sanctuary. It, of course, people have to be fed. We understand that. And they come to the sanctuary to have their thirst slaked and uh, hunger satisfied so that they can exit filled with word to spread. And if there isn't that transmission taking place, if it's only celebration and then go home to watch the Super Bowl, it is not accomplishing its task. Well said, as always, our guest, Dr. William B. Allen, on The Public Square, this program. If you joined us late, you need to go back and listen from the beginning. You can do that at thepublicsquare.com. More coming up.
Going Deep today with Dr. William B. Allen is our guest here on The Public Square. Always great to have Dr. Allen with us, and especially so today, Dave, because you are announcing his new book, I understand. Well, I'm late a week to the announcement, but delighted to be a part of of, uh, any celebration of the work of William B. Allen. And this one, (laughs) um, this is a blockbuster. Um, and, And I would tell you that probably to most in the academic world, a surprise. Hmm. Because what we're about to talk to right now, uh, talk about right now is a work on the writings and of Montesquieu, The Spirit of the Laws. And I'm going to let Dr. Allen explain that to us and to our listeners with the authority that he has rightly earned on this. But let me just say as a disclaimer going into this, we're not ex- uh, celebrating this moment as if we have reached some academic plateau uh, of, of ascendancy. We are doing this with the excitement of realizing that someone has taken a work that meant so much to our founders and is once again attempting, and this has only happened three times before um, in the history of the world, to take and, and bring this work to a place where we can understand what they were thinking about in the books that they were reading. So I want to uh, let Dr. Um, Allen announce this wonderful work. It is now available, The Spirit of the Laws. And Doc, explain to us what this book is. Well, let me first appreciate your use of the term blockbuster, David. Uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, that, that's better than what I used to say to people. I say it's a doorstop. <laughs> it's a it's a big book. It's a thousand pages. Wow. But but of course it's parallel text, so that you only have to read half of it, because half okay. is English and half is French. That's oh, good to know. Okay. All right, all right. Half is English, half is French, and it's published by Anthem Press in London. So we've got all the bases covered. <laughs> so 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 the point of this book, of course, is to say we need to be to stay in contact with the ideas that generated this Republican experiment in the United States. And, and this was central among them. Things that we take for granted and we speak about so commonly, like separation of powers and checks and balances, they originate here. And they began to influence this country as early as 1754. It didn't wait for the revolution. We saw it invoked in Massachusetts in a legal case defending the freedom of the press by Daniel Fole. And we saw that of the authorities cited by the founding generation, this work was cited more frequently than any other work after the Bible. So that was the order of priority, the Bible, the spirit of the laws. Now, this is an extraordinary work in terms of the modern development of liberal theory because it doesn't follow the track of liberal individualism or atomization. It doesn't treat human beings as if they are disconnected. It is based on taking the family as, by nature, the foundation of society. And it elaborates that theory all the way up to the full and complete development of constitutional forms. So we can trace from origins of family relations to mature political development, the requirements for a political society in which people can exercise freedom of conscience and enjoy the security of liberty of person and property, and also restrain the power of the state. All of that is conveyed in this book. But that only begins to tell the story. That's why at the end of the volume, you have my commentary of a couple of hundred pages because it requires further explanation. And as I say to people, this is not bedtime reading unless you have trouble falling asleep, yeah. in which case it's better than relaxium. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is clearly the case that this is really that is essential for understanding what it is that was expected here. And at the very center of it, at the heart of it, is a perplexing statement that no one else previously has tried to unfold as I unfolded here. And that's Montesquieu's observation that Christianity is the greatest gift that man ever received. Hmm. 
Now, to find that statement in a philosophical text is mind-blowing. That doesn't happen in philosophy. And one has to unfold it. And so, what I, so the importance of this book is bringing that observation together with all the powers of reasoning to defend the appropriate form of a political society. Now, that quote is found in Book 24. Correct. Of Montesquieu. And I only know that because I listened to Dr. Allen's lecture that he recently gave at the Institute on World Politics. And so I knew that, but I also had a, a clue. He gave me a hint earlier. So I've been cheating on my notes in advance. <laughs> so let's call it the B24 statement. All right. Mm -hmm. and, and let's repeat that. Montesquieu said what about Christianity? Christianity is the greatest gift that mankind has ever received. Wow, what a statement. Can we go back and give me a, give me a thumbnail of who this man was? Well, yes. Charles-Louis II, Baron de la Brede de Montesquieu. Thank was you. A French uh, it's aristocrat. exactly what I was thinking, yeah. yeah. I, I was going to ask how to pronounce his first name. Yeah. He only had like yeah. 10 names, like most French at that time. I was going to say that, but didn't want to show off. So go ahead. <laughs> Hashtag Monty, yes. Uh, he, he was a French aristocrat. Uh, descended from a, a noble family. He was a jurist, but he, he stopped the practice of jurisprudence and law relatively early to develop a career as a writer and a member of the French Academy. Spent a lot of time, therefore, in Paris rather than in his home outside of Bordeaux in France. He wrote several books, and the first of which was a book called The Persian Letters. Mm -hmm. and, and what was important about The Persian Letters, it's a, it's a brief tale of... Uh, it, written in diary form or letter form, correspondence, epistolary, but actually a novel contrasting life in uh, what was then Persia and, and Europe, primarily France, showing differences in cultures, manners, mores, religion, all those things. The book was wildly successful, but at the heart of that book was a question, a fundamental question, and that was the nature of how religion travels among human communities. Hmm. That's the fundamental question. And so he returns to that question in the spirit of the laws. And he's responding to the ancient historian Herodotus, who claimed that religion cannot be communicated from one culture or society to another. And he says, no, that's wrong. And this is how we get to the statement, the observation about Christianity. Yes, true religion does communicate. So when he's describing the relations among societies, different societies, different cultures, and especially when he's emphasizing commerce, he's using that commerce in terms of the expression communication or intercourse. Yes, these different societies can interact with one another, and they especially can do so on the foundation of true religion. Dr. Allen, I just have, well, I've got like 10 questions, but only <laughs> one for right this second. Uh, I know that uh, Baron de Montesquieu was raised in, as a Huguenot or in a French Protestant home. So then what you are saying is that his faith uh, directly impacted his writings in the spirit of the laws. Am I reading too much into that, or is that pretty fair? Only slightly too much. His mother was okay. Huguenot descendant, but his father was Catholic, and he was raised Catholic. Oh, okay. and I'm, and, I'm and he died in the, died died in the Catholic confession. But yes, the Huguenot the Huguenot background was strongly powerful in his life, and helped to shape his understanding. There's no question about that. Well, we have a lot more questions for Dr. Allen, and we'll get to those next. I know Melanie has one, and Jeff, as he said, has more. So we'll come back to our great conversation with Dr. William B. Allen here on The Public Square. Spreading the light of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. Let's continue the conversation with Dr. William B. Allen regarding his new book, Montesquieu, The Spirit of the Laws. We're just getting acquainted with who this man was before the break. And Melanie, you had a question. Well, he had such a firm stance 
especially with the expression of Christianity being the greatest gift mankind has ever received. He was raised Catholic, but he married a Protestant woman. Would would his marriage to Jean, and maybe that's not how you even pronounce her name, um, <laughs> would that have impacted his view, his pers- his his own walk of faith, so to speak? Yeah, I think that was more powerfully affected by his mother, who was, as, as I okay. said, Huguenot descendant. Uh, and, and so her uh, religious faith, her Protestantism, had the primary influence upon him in that respect. The role but, of the mother. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> praying mom, praying moms. Well, I, I, well, I love that. <laughs> speaking of the role of the mother, let me segue to the mother country of America and uh, the war for independence, why would people seeking to address their grievances with the mother country, why would they turn to this French jurist aristocrat for, and what? And what's the portal? Where's the connection? What were they looking for? It's an interesting question. Very interesting question, because uh, at one level we don't know, at another level we do. The work took the world by storm. The most literate people in the world were the people in British North America, the colonists. Really? They they imported material, they read widely, they followed the conversations in Europe. So what was happening in Europe was happening in British North America at the same time. But not only did the colonists read this, uh, what is the greatest surprise, and I've only learned this since completing the book, and so that means there's another book that has to come, is that... (laughs) The Prince of Wales, who ultimately became King George III, was also passionately devoted to this book, wow. who read it extensively, who in fact translated or slash paraphrased it through hundreds of pages when he was a late teenager, among other things that he read and studied. So that this is what people turn to. This was the go-to. One of the reasons is because Montesquieu took as his model the English Constitution. And he made that explicit in writing the spirit of the laws. And what he said early on in this work is, the British Constitution is a republic disguised as a monarchy. Hmm. And then the book unfolds all the meaning of that. And George III actually attempts to accomplish all the implications of that statement, such that the American Revolution takes place in the context in which George III is trying to reform the British Constitution. So it's not a surprise. Didn't the British already have some kind of division, uh, separation of powers in their parliamentary system? They had a separate uh, jurisprudence. They had a separate legislator. Then the executive part was involved in the king. I'm, I'm sure I've got that messed up somehow. But you, you, you don't have it messed up. They had these divisions among them. But here's the crit- critical thing. Up until George III, sovereignty was crown sovereignty in the British Constitution. Only after George III did it become parliamentary sovereignty. Now, it's true that that was hinted at by Locke, but not accomplished. And by the time Blackstone describes parliamentary sovereignty, that's in the aftermath of the constitutional reforms launched by George III. And that transition changes everything because those distinct offices you're describing Mm -hmm. prior to George III they only represented oligarchical opportunities. The Whig oligarchy during the Robinocracy in Britain meant that people in Parliament basically stood around. They had the right, they had gained the right to control the revenues to the crown, but not the dispensing. So they would make the revenues available to the crown, and then they would stand around with hands out. <laughs> and it, it was just an oligarchy. And this was the change that was being led by George III. No, you don't come to the crown with your hand out anymore. The crown is no longer going to be sovereign, just a presiding eminence. You've got to go back and you've got to do policy making. You've got to dispense the money. I'm tired of having to pay you greedy money seekers and place seekers. <laughs> okay. With this backdrop, bring us back to the colonies. What's, what's going on here? Oh, well, this is an interesting story that has yet to be developed, and I don't have it fully developed yet, because as I said, a lot of this is new. George III's papers were only released in the last couple of years. 
with this translation wow. of the Spirit of the Laws was released in 2019. They've been closed in the Royal Archives. So we've got a lot of work to do. But I have a theory, which is buttressed by the experience that we do know. George ascended the throne in 1762. Between 1762 and 1770, he chewed up eight prime ministers trying to get the right combination. One's out, in, one's out. And what was Parliament doing? Parliament was changing laws constantly, tax laws, revenue laws, and ending with the Declaratory Act, trying to establish its authority over British North America. That means it was all hit and miss, fits and starts, in the context where in Britain, Parliament was trying to accept its role as a policymaking body, but didn't quite know how to execute it. Fascinating. And executing it badly is what provoked the revolution. So that is now, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm stunned. That's, that's a connecting of the dots, actually. Yeah. That's so yeah. helpful. Well, yeah. That's profound. And this was going to be segment five because <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Allen uh, announced this with the announcement of the book at the Institute of World Politics. And he said, so here's my big surprise at the end of the speech. He said, in my discoveries, I had thought that there were only three translations of Montesquieu's work ever been done and published. And this, of course, his latest would have been the third. He said, but I've discovered I'm actually the fourth. And then he explained oh. to this crowd that that in the journals of the British historians had been this file that he had found from King George III. And then he closed it by saying, thus, the need for another book. <laughs> to which they applauded and to which we applaud as well. Now, it, it may take us a long time to get through this one. but <laughs> And I would say you're in good company, uh, Dr. Allen, except he, his reputation is not great. So I'm not sure it was good company you're in. <laughs> well, well, this is the whole point, Wayne. What, what I think I'm going to end up showing is that the Declaration of Independence, though it is right in principles, it is fake news calling George a tyrant. <laughs> wow. It was, was wow. it propaganda? Okay, that's a game changer. No, maybe yes, just a yes. cosmic <laughs> misunderstanding. Wow. Yes, I guess I yes. stumbled into that one, didn't I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're going to have to recast oh. Hamilton. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let me let me come back now to, to the question of the U.S. Constitution. We've only got a minute and a half here, so we're going to take this into the next segment, of course. But... How uh, much did the framers look to Montesquieu's understandings of politics and life and human nature as they tried to assemble the Constitution? Was this also a core resource for them? For, there were those who read it carefully, people like James Wilson among them. But mostly what they read were the constitutional prescriptions, the defenses of the separation of powers, the defense of the extended kingdom or republic, the large state. Uh, the defense of checks and balances. Uh, they, they, they read it on the question of personal security and liberty. For example, when Montesquieu writes, there is no such thing as a thought crime. That animated people who wanted to defend the freedom of conscience, liberty of the press, and freedom of speech. And also, it is at the heart of this work, the spirit of the laws, that we find the secular origination of the abolitionist argument, the argument against slavery in every form, including race-based slavery. This work was published in 1748. George III became an anti-slavery uh, advocate through that experience of reading the spirit of the laws. And therefore, we can say they saw a great deal in Montesquieu pertinent to them, but in their deliberations for the Constitution, they focused on the constitutional structures. What a topic today here on The Public Square. <laughs> uh, we've learned so much, and there's more to come. Some of you have to leave us at this time. If that's your case on your radio station, please listen to the rest. It's a must-listen program at thepublicsquare.com. We'll be right back for more on The Public Square.
Once again, our guest on The Public Square today with our panel is Dr. William B. Allen. And uh, Dave, um, I'm just so eager to re-listen to this conversation all over again because I know I've missed some, some important points that need to be made here today. Well, I have one point of strong difference with Dr. Allen, and that's that he defines his book as a doorstop. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. <laughs> because it exceeds a thousand pages. Um, I am, I am, I'm, we are honored to talk about this book. Uh, it, it's so many levels, and and uh, I do think it's a blockbuster work. To think that something's being done that has only been attempted uh, three other times in history, and one of those attempts was George the Third, King of England, and mm-hmm. we didn't know that until Dr. Allen told us about that, which is a recent discovery yeah. as well. The point is, uh, we get to segment five, and it's usually the so what segment. Mm-hmm. So what does this have to do with my daily life as a citizen? of heaven and a citizen here on earth. We talked about escapism. You know, the Lord said that we are citizens of an eternal kingdom. There's no doubt about it. But he left us here for a reason and told us to occupy until I come. Doc, um, you've been teaching about Montesquieu for a lifetime. Um, What does this mean for the average American? What is this understanding of where these thoughts came from? Why is that important? Well, consider today, we spend a lot of time trying to define democracy. And we do a very poor job of it. And we think it consists merely in voting. Well, it's works like the spirit of the laws that take us into the heart of what democracy means or what republicanism means or what monarchy means. And then we get to think through the principles, for example, we show that there are four cardinal human goods that Montesquieu explains. So they begin with virtue, which is associated with democracy in a small state. But he liberates it from that and shows that virtue is always relevant in every human community. And the remaining cardinal human goods are justice, liberty, and constitutionalism. I got the order reversed, but that's okay. The, those are the four things that make it possible for human beings to live decent lives. What could be more important for us than to reflect carefully on what the conditions of decency are when we find ourselves besieged by so much indecency? Um, Montesquieu valued the family Tell me more about that. Well, the, the, the point to understand is that uh, human society didn't grow out of arbitrary decisions, out of the mere imposition of power. It grew first out of the formation of families, i.e. commitments human beings made to one another. It was only subsequent to that that the extended family, the growth of families produced communities in which people discovered opportunities for power, which led to abuse. And so politics is the response to the abuses that came after people discovered opportunities for power, which means that prior to politics, the heart of what it means to be human is to live in a family, to have okay. parents and children. The whole nine yards. Self-government begins with me. The first community of government is my family. Correct. And if those two pieces are right, then politics is a lot easier to deal with, right? And if those two are right, then what the only other thing you need is a sufficient restraint on power to allow them to flourish. The whole point of politics is to limit power such that the natural community can flourish. Okay. That one, I just need to, I, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next week. (laughs) Okay. I'm done. I mean, (laughs) that's all the time we have. Yeah. (laughs) Right, right there. Rob, I got a feeling I know what's going through your mind. We had a friend who was governor uh, of a major state for a number of years, and we had a chance to work with him on a lot of projects, including school choice and many other things. And, I remember one time, first time I heard he I heard him say this. We we were walking into a restaurant after after a big political thing or something, and it was just a handful of us. We walked into this restaurant, busy restaurant on a, on a weekend, 
Um, and and he looked around and he saw all these families. And and there was, we were standing in line. He was a very humble guy, all right? He, he, they didn't call ahead. He went in, this people got, got us a reservation. We stood in line and we waited like everybody else. And he was just watching and observing everything. And it was kind of hilarious because I'm watching as people are sort of bumping each other in the elbow as 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 they see that he's in the restaurant. <laughs> that, 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 that's the governor. That's the governor. Okay. Uh, and he looks at me and he says, you know, I've spent my whole life in politics to reach this conclusion. If I had a magic wand and could wave it and fix the most amount of things in the shortest order, I would fix the family. Hmm. I don't think this governor ever read Montesquieu, but I think he just stated that summary, right? Is that is that right? Yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. If you fix the family, uh, so many other things can be fixed as well. And now we're in a position where our government is actually uh, working in ways that I think people would say are anti-family. Yeah, any time the government becomes custodian and ward, it replaces the family. That's what I've observed over the years, Dave, just being involved in the development of policy or protecting us from uh, policies gone wrong is that the, the government quite often wants to be the substitute for yes. the family, especially mm -hmm. in schools. Um, we hear so often, you know, we have to, we have to be the parent at the school um, because these kids don't have stability in their homes. So, you know, it's, it's a vicious cycle. Yes. It's worrisome to watch the devolving of policy when it comes to the family. You're right. So right, Melanie. And it's really important to observe that they don't have to have an ill intention when they do this, the policymakers right. and the politicians. They may have the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. They're just simply using means that can accomplish the end. That's mm -hmm. why we limit power. Real politics limits power. It does not extend power. One of the things, Doc, and we're getting ready to close here, that Montesquieu wrote about is the extraordinary gift of Christianity to the world in that it is a religion in which its followers are commanded to love their neighbor. Indeed. I thought, now that's interesting. I never thought about it that way before. I'm guessing he had a lot more to say in that regard about the benefit of Christian doctrine in regards to civil society. And if I could piggyback on that, it seems like, uh, I mean, he wrote this hundreds of years before our time, but what would he say about uh, modern Christianity? I, I would be quite certain that he would not make a distinction, uh, which comes out because his account of modernity itself, that's part of what the book is about, is showing how these things will develop in the modern world, what modern liberalism will look like. And one of the most curious statements that he makes occurs in the 19th book. I mean, he says, in this society, you're going to have a diversity of interests, and people are going to reason from a, a, an infinite variety of directions, and their reasoning will amount to nothing. <laughs> that, that's not the point. It's important that they reason. It's, the point is not that they come to exact conclusions that they're exercising their reasoning is the important thing, that they're accepting their responsibility to judge. That's what's important. Well, Wayne, this is an extraordinary conversation. Dr. Allen, the book is now out. It's Anthem Press is how you can find the book online. Um, and uh, we highly recommend that you go to the source of the publisher, because if you're interested in a copy, it's not an inexpensive work at a thousand pages, but the best buy you can get is from Anthem Press. And we will do our best to continue to break down this conversation uh, as the weeks and months unfold. Dr. Allen, never could say thank you enough for being our friend and our ally and for this great work. And we pray God's incredible blessing upon it and upon you and your household. I thank you so much, and I uh, pray that you will all continue to labor in the vineyards <laughs> and to uh, cultivate and encourage friends not to be defeatist. The Public Square is a broadcast service of the American Policy Roundtable.